What is up, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of The Tape Team, a show where we talk about some of my favorite horror movies in my ever-growing VHS collection. This week, love is in the air because it's Valentine's season. But more important than some shitty Hallmark holiday, it's Black History Month through all of February, and we thought we would take this weekend to recognize one of our favorite black characters in horror movie history from 1972's Blackula, a black Avenger. Blackula, Dracula's soul brother. Blackula. Uh, thanks anyway, played by none other than classically trained Shakespearean actor, William Marshall, who would go on to play the king of cartoons in Pee-wee's Playhouse, my liege. Black Yellow was the first black vampire to ever appear on screen, and although its name is a little on the nose, this movie is way better than you would expect it to be. William Marshall worked diligently with the producers to make sure this character retained his dignity. He gave him a name change and a background story that ultimately made the movie what it is today instead of, hey, here's Black Dracula with a bunch of funk and soul music playing in the background. And trust me, there is a shit ton of funk and soul music playing in the background, including this absolute banger by the Hughes Corporation. <laughs> This guy knows what I'm talking about. To direct this funky fanged flick, we have William Crane, who's brought us The Mod Squad, The Dukes of Hazzard TV series, and Dr. Black Mr. Hyde. Yes, that is the name of that movie. And on the writer's block, we have Joan Torres and Raymond Koenig, who worked together to bang out this movie and return one year later for the sequel, Scream Blackula Scream, which is Blackula, but with voodoo. voodoo. No, but what's this movie about? I'll have you take one guess. Roll the film. This movie starts out at the Dracula estate way back in 1780. Prince Mamawalde and his wife have been sent by the elders of the Nigerian Ibani tribe to speak with the Count in an attempt to aid them in suppressing the slave trade. Turns out Dracula is a super racist asshole, and instead of offering to help, he insults Mamawalde and his wife and laughs at the idea. As Mamawalde tries to leave, he is captured by Dracula's guards and, re and restrained as he has the blood drained by him by the Count. Dracula then seals Mamawalde in a coffin, bestowing the vampire's curse upon him. And for the first and last time, we let Dracula name one of his victims. You shall be... Blackula. Mama Walde's wife Luva is sealed in the tomb alongside with her prince's coffin, left to idly sit by and die alongside her love. Now it's the future, and at some point Drac must have forgotten to pay his bill, so now we have two interior decorators at an estate sale for the castle. Of course, they find this rather hip coffin and have it sent on over to Los Angeles. Later on, while in the warehouse with all the new stuff, Billy gets a rather nasty cut while trying to open a crate. As luck would have it, Bobby just unlocked the coffin at the same exact time. The smell of blood fills the air, waking Blackula from his slumber in a typical just-woke-up goofy vampire shakiness, he attacks his first victims. At Bobby's funeral, Blackula is hanging out and taking this crazy new world around him when he notices that one of the attendants, Tina, has an uncanny resemblance to his lost wife, Luva. Tina is there with her friend and her friend's boyfriend, Dr. Gordon Thomas, who is a pathologist for the LAPD. After the funeral, Blackula follows Tina out only to frighten her, as to be expected if a giant man in a cape lurks behind you in LA at night, leading to a super funky chase scene. On the other side of town, Dr. Gordon notices something weird about some of the deaths that have been happening. They all have the same weird marking on their neck, leading him to his own mission and into the occult. Mama Walde's plan to get together with Tina and Dr. Gordon's plan to figure out if it's possible that vampires are attacking the citizens of LA are bound to get tangled up sooner than later, leading us to a climax where we see Blackula do something that any other previous vampire had never done before. Throw some fucking hands. What will the outcome be? Whatever it is, it will certainly be funky with Blackula. Now let me just say that I'm not totally oblivious that there are some things in this movie that are absolutely not appropriate by today's standards. This movie is part of the blaxploitation subgenre and definitely plays into some harmful stereotypes, and they'd most definitely drop an F-bomb or two in this film. And I'm not talking about fuck, I'm sure you can figure it out either way. Not classy. However, movies like Blackula were a major breakthrough back in the day. Movies like this one, Blackenstein, Abbey, and Dr. Black, Mr. Hyde, other than needing better titles, were some of the first films post the race films of the 40s and 60s that saw people of color as the heroes of the story as opposed to the villain or sidekick. William Marshall no doubt puts on a spectacular show in this movie, making Blackula just a lovable character. We see him usually more in the light of a hero, like in the beginning of the film, and then you just can't help but feel a little bad for him as he's seeking out something long lost to him. Although with that super funky background, it can't help but feel
feel a little funny in modern times, and that definitely adds to some of this movie's charm. Blackula is a legitimate horror movie that deserves more respect. It has real moments of horror and suspense, and of course, King of Cuckoo. For all these reasons and more, Blackula is a perfect fit for us here at the tape too. Here's some facts about Blackula. Blackula was shot on location in Los Angeles with some scenes shot in Watts and the final scenes taken at the Hyperion Outfall Treatment Plant in Playa del Rey. The group playing in the club scene is the Hughes Corporation who's most known for their 1974 hit, Rock the Boat. This movie was in production from late January to late March of 1972, which is a pretty lengthy filming period by Corman standards. Thank you all for watching this week's episode of The Tape Tomb. I've been your host with the most, Larry Downs. And if you've liked this episode, make sure you click that like and subscribe button down below. We're always talking about cool new movies here at The Tape Tomb, and we could tell you about another one. Make sure you tune in every other week for our sister series, Airlock Shock, starring Nick Hask, and he talks about some of his favorite sci-fi movies, just like we do horror here at The Tape Tomb. This is Larry Downs signing off. Stay spooky, my friends, and we'll see you in the sequel.